Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. We haven't been uh, we haven't been in this room for a while. I haven't been in this room for a while. I like this room. I know it gets uh, beat up sometimes, but this is terrific. Welcome to um, a wonderful afternoon of singing. Um, I'm speaking to you here, and I'm also very aware that we're speaking to an international community. We've had extraordinary uh, response to live broadcasting of classes, not just in Manhattan in general, and its rather phenomenal distance learning program, led by the great Dean Christian Orto, as we've already heard. Uh, yeah, she's quite amazing, she really is. And her spectacular team of nameless people who are turning all sorts of buttons and dialing all sorts of cameras and sending me messages, don't stand in the shadows on the left, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, but to our international uh, audience, if I can say welcome as you come and go on the net or your iPad or your iPhone, uh, I could be completely pretentious and greet you in several languages, but I know that there is a significant German contingent that is certainly watching this. Uh, because they watch everything that I do, and also because in a week and a half I will be at my song academy in Heidelberg. So, wenn ich nur uh, sagen darf, Grüß Gott aus New York, willkommen in New York, in Manhattan School of Music, meine andere Zuhause hier von, uh, sagen wir es von Lehrgang halt, und ich freue mich schon sehr, in Heidelberg wieder zu sein, und wir sehen einander spätestens 3. oder 4. April. So, that's the end of that German missile and Freundschaft. <laughs> Um, digital technologies are sometimes misunderstood, I think. Uh, today, we're getting better at it. Most of us in this room, certainly under the age of 30, which is most of the people in this room, or 25, <laughs> uh, know a lot more about the usefulness or the self-understoodness of digital technologies than those of us above that age. Uh, I think it goes without saying that what education will look like in this country or any country, certainly Western countries, in the next 10 years, we do not know. What I do hope is that technology serves us for the purpose of education and serves you for the acquisition of knowledge and understanding of your own lives and the power of the arts and humanities in that search and is at your behest and not the reason why you do things or the reason why you are captured by some project. Media must be an enhancement of the live performance, or it becomes something quite uninteresting and quite sterile, in my opinion. I love all of the HD broadcasts. I loved VHS in its day, television broadcasts. When television came out, everyone of any kind of progressive mentality said, ah, the savior of education. Well, we got that one wrong. Hopefully, we can get internet right. Uh, and the other medium that I'm very passionate about, of course, is radio, as you heard. There's nothing going away about radio. Internet radio and digital radio is a fantastic medium. Now, what is this all about? What's that got to do with singing? Well, it's the world you live in. It's the world we all live in, but it is certainly the world you live in as young musicians, and it is the world you are going into as young professionals, those of you who will go up this salmon ladder and keep going in whatever salmon ladder that is to become a professional singer. You are going to be in a more microphone, captured, souvenired world than any of us in my generation ever thought possible, or quite frankly, fought for so long because we wanted to be paid for it. Most people in your generation think music should not be paid for, period. We'll have that discussion some other day. <laughs> <coughs> Certainly, copyright should be paid for, but this is a very, very energetic world. The idea of telegenics has become a very sine qua non of who you are as a performer because, and this is where the good news comes in, but also the bad news, we have lost our ability to listen. I am not pulling any punches today. I'm tired of being discreet and nice about things. I've reached my 50s. I've been doing this for 30 years. I get to say what I think. And I want to pass this to you, not because I'm right, but because you have the right to think about these things. We must learn to listen. And it starts with us who ask people to listen to us. It is not about us. It isn't about me. What I do as a Iago at the Met, just as a banal ex example at the moment, and certainly because I got a nice review in the Times. <laughs> huh. I've sung a lot of good performances that got bad reviews, so there you are. The point is not the review. My point is, it isn't about me. 
It's about what I firmly believe, or Mr. Kura firmly believes, or Ms. Uh, Stoyanova firmly believes, or the conductor firmly believes, about Othello. It's what Verdi believed about Othello. It's what Boito learned about Othello. It all is about the notion of humanness. It's about who we are, what we think, what we say to one another, what we feel, and we as artists recreate those circumstances, those things that are the utmost humanness of ourselves, continually in different languages, and in a language called music. And this is the crux of it, the language called music. Music is a language. It is not the beautiful and sometimes irritating conveyance of sound hovering around, underneath, over, or through a word. Prima la musica e poi le parole is an answer to a question that should not be asked. When you have word and music, you have two language searching for a dialogue of the same metaphor of the human experience. Sometimes that's love, sometimes that's hate, sometimes that's euphoria, sometimes it's very in your face, sometimes it's so layered that it's everything that's not being said, all of those sorts of things. The, our job as a singer is to be a detailed scientist, if you will, to understand those layers so that they are visually and audibly, mostly audibly, accessible by our public so that they can take the journey that they should take to understand that which we've decided to make audible. You will hear me say, if once a hundred times a day, hear it, breathe into that, and make that audible. What I mean by that as a singer is that I have not thought once consciously about what kind of breath I need to say all these things that I want to say before we get started. I have said them in different emphasis, in different connotations, in different contexts, and in different inflections sometimes louder, sometimes softer, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. I don't think about what breath I need because the breath is automatic because of it, what I want to express. This is the self-understood role that we must get to as singers. If your breath is not self-understood to that which you want to sing because your technique knows that the tone needs that to make that happen because you got this thought and you can walk away from it because what you really want to do is make sure that that moment of Schubert is believable, then you're not quite done with your work, right? At this level, where you are now, this is where you have the luxury of time to try all the different things, to make sure the shoe fits, if you want that metaphor, you know, get all that straightened out. You don't have a day to lose. It's now time. It's your time to learn how to make decisions. Do not make extraneous noise. Don't allow yourself to have nonsense thoughts, right? Or at least recognize them as such. Build your index of these kinds of things today. Because what you do as a musician is heard by others who are not. And the question is why? Why should they be heard? Well, we think it's very important what's heard, whether it's the clarinet quintet or an aria from Feras and Elizanda. We think it's desperately important. Are we sure why? That's the other aspect. What I've gone through right now is kind of three layers that I like to talk about or three connectives we have as artists and certainly as singers. The first one would be sort of the spiritual, what it's all about, <clears throat> the big ticket item. Well, it's about, oh my God, and everybody feels, oh my God, when the song's over. The second layer would be what I would call the emotional or the engineering level. What's the language? What's the epoch? What are the certain connections? What are the things we need to add up because we need to know what this score means? Is it piano? Is it mezzo forte? Is it, is it 19th century? Is it 20th century? Is it, you know, what are we doing? With, what's all this stuff? If it's, a, if it's an operatic role, what kind of shoes would you have on? What kind of costume would you be? You're going to be in sandals? You're going to be in heels? All that kind of stuff. That's all that context stuff over here. Then you've got, especially as a singer, this physical thing. And I'll be very honest with you, if you don't understand your body in some very basic way, and I'm speaking to the students here in this room in your 20s, if you're not learning about your body, how many ribs you have, where your arms go, how they're hooked up, why does your feet, why do your feet do what they do, what does your spine do, so forth and so on, how do I carry my head, why is it that I don't just fall apart while walking down a street, uh, you know, all those kinds of questions. If you don't know that, you will never be a great singer. It's that simple. I don't know any pianist on the face of the planet who cannot tell you exactly how this box works. 
why in the hell should we be any different? I am so tired of being discreet about this and diplomatic about this. If you don't know your body, you will never be a great singer. I don't know any great singer who doesn't know their body. So do your yoga, do your body work, get it together, figure all that. We're going to talk a lot about breath and the positioning of breath. You can have the most wonderful soul on earth. You can be blessed with the most incredible voice you ever wanted. And if you can't stand up straight, stay home. <laughs> and by the way, it goes right on into production mentality as well. If you don't know your body as a young singer today, you're not going to be able to do physically what a lot of producers would like you to do and still be true to that thing we call sound and music. It's a balance, it's a question of negotiation. But you can't refuse to do something on stage you think is, is inappropriate physically if you don't know whether you can or can't do it. So this is all these things coming together. So when I hear somebody sing, I don't care whether it's my colleague standing next to me on stage or you today, I'm hearing simultaneously why, what, and how. I believe all questions lead back to why. If we're clear about why we want to make that audible, we'll be curious about what it takes to make it audible. And those two things will always inevitably enliven and enrich the how. So let's start the other way around. School is so much about how, how, how. Triads, technique, chords, yeah, mm, sight reading, theory, uh, languages. Those are engineering tools, and they're very important. But let's never lose sight of the fact that we want to build buildings like Frank Gehry that you look at and go, how on earth does that stand up? Because it's a phenomenal understanding of the engineering and the rules of nature that allow the fantasy to be something that takes us to a complete other realization of a sense of gravity. It's no less in the world of music and certainly no less in the world of singing.